Strange but true stories. Tales from the light side, the dark side, and the other side. I'm Steve White. Alone. Yeah, that can make us feel one of two ways, right? I mean, if it's by choice, like when you're curled up with a good book and a hot cup of coffee, or maybe you've got the house and the television all to yourself and you can binge a show on Netflix, you know, we feel good. Finally, some alone time. And then there are those times when we are alone, not by choice, but by necessity or happenstance. Walking alone down the cliché dark alley, or in a situation where having another person with you would offer some protection. What if we could always count on someone or something coming to our aid when we needed it, even if we were physically alone? Not a superhero, but more of a mystical feeling of a protective force surrounding you. The feeling of never walking alone would be pretty nice. Well, today's stories are from people that have had those sorts of experiences. This first story is from a young lady who is a longtime viewer and subscriber to SBT. I'm starting my strange but true story by saying I have always felt that my guardian angel is my great-grandmother who passed away when I was three. Mostly because I could just feel her presence and I could also hear her call me feisty whenever I would get myself into trouble. It was her little nickname that she gave me that only she used when I was born. When I was 16, my other great-grandmother passed on. Now, this lady had been more like a grandmother to me, and she was like, more like the family angel. The odd thing is, is that I feel closer to her in death than I did in life. Now, when I was 19, I had a life-altering problem. There was this guy. He had been part of our group when we were in high school. It seemed innocent enough at first, just a crush. I thought once he realized that we didn't really click, he'd move on. Well, he didn't. Now, one day he cornered me and just demanded I give him a chance. He scared me in the way he was acting. I had already seen signs of abusive behavior that made me nervous. He never really listened to me, and he always put me down in a passive sort of way. Stuff like, you'll never marry unless you pick me. Don't get knocked up in college. Or, I should have asked you out when we first met, but you were always dating other dudes. In fact, I had not actually dated anyone until that year he asked me out. On this particular day, I felt a hand on my shoulder. Not just a presence, but a feeling of a hand gripping my shoulder. And it was the loving grasp of my great-grandma. I just know it. It was there to give me the courage and strength I needed to not cave in, to stand taller and face this guy and tell him no. He still persisted, trying to make me believe I needed to give him a chance. I started to have visions in my head of what my life would be like if I actually did give him a chance. And they weren't nice images. Still, he kept asking. And it was at this point that I heard my great-grandmother's voice in my head saying, You are going to meet someone special someday, feisty. Don't give up. And images followed of what my life would be like with that special person that my great-grandmother had promised. Of me being loved and loving back. I stood up for myself each and every scary time I was confronted by this guy because I felt both my great-grandmothers with me now, reaching over from the other side, giving me the strength I needed. I know that I wouldn't have been able to face him alone, and I truly don't think I was. So, maybe this simple short story will inspire others facing their own personal demons to not give up that there is something and someone worth fighting for. You just can't always see it. It was July 2019. 
The strangest occurrence happened to which I have no plausible explanation. Being July, it was hot. My wife, daughter, and I were getting ready to drive over to my parents' house, and they lived in this gated community. It was a house that I grew up in. Now, before we got into the car, I had this bad feeling in my gut that I just couldn't figure out. But it was just a great feeling of anxiety. Like, we shouldn't make this trip to my parents' house. A feeling of dread. I shook it off as nothing, and we loaded up our little girl in the car seat and got in the car and started the eight-mile journey to my parents' house. Now, as I'm about to make the left turn into the neighborhood, I saw this old guy wearing a white shirt and black shorts, and he popped out of nowhere. He's waving and yelling at me. Uh, Where did this guy come from? I hadn't seen him until just prior to making the turn. I stopped the car, rolled down the window. He was frantically pointing at the front of my car. Well, I looked and I saw smoke. And then I saw flames coming out from under the hood. He's yelling at me to turn the car off and for us to get out of the car quickly. I did. I turned the car off. I swung around in my seat. I grabbed my daughter out of the child's seat, pulled her out of the car, and we ran to safety. And we watched the car burn for several minutes. My parents' house overlooks the road, and they could see the fire from their backyard. They had seen the old guy as well, but not until all the commotion had started. But they hadn't seen him wandering around prior to that. The old guy was comforting us and telling us that the car is replaceable, and our lives are not. Finally, after what felt like forever, the fire department rolled up. I looked away from this man just to make sure that the sirens were indeed coming for us. And when I looked back to thank him, he wasn't there. Nowhere to be seen. I looked all around. He had just disappeared. The entire road is about a mile, and it leads to a dead end, and you can see the entire thing from where this happened. There's a a big hill on one side of the road and the neighborhood on the other, If he had gone through the gate, we would have seen him as you can see both forks of the road inside the neighborhood through it. I hate the fact that I never got his name or even thought to ask it. But he did save us from harm that day. He was not just a figment of my imagination. My wife saw him. My parents saw him. Now here's the weird thing. There were cameras at the gate and we contacted the security company. They confirmed they had a viewpoint of the accident scene, and they sent a version of it to my dad. You see me getting out of the car with our daughter, my wife, the car on fire, but there's no old guy anywhere to be seen in that video image. That guy was our guardian angel, no doubt about it, and we will all be forever grateful. And for our last story today, it's a short one. And maybe one that you can pass off as a series of coincidences. But haven't you been there before? A series of events prevent you from doing something again and again. And you start to get the feeling that maybe it's in your best interest to actually not do that thing. Yeah, that's in essence this story. But to the person who sent us this story, this wasn't just a series of coincidences. It was her guardian angel looking out for her. I'm Portuguese, and I have epilepsy. When I was seven years old, I went to a famous neurologist in Portugal. After doing a brain scan, he told my parents that what the scan showed was not normal and that I could actually die at any moment. Not very comforting to my parents or me. The way he explained it, My brain scan showed a big black shadow on the right side of the brain, and the doctors thought it was blood or lots of blood vessels in that area. He wanted to do an exam that was typically only done on adults. The procedure consisted of putting a camera in my vein and directing it to the trouble area of the brain to check what it was. Complicating the matter was that I was a seven-year-old kid. Movement of my head on my part could possibly cause a rupture in my vein, and I could die. 
They couldn't put me under for this procedure because I had to perform a series of specific movements with other parts of my body. And if I happened to have a seizure during the exam, I would more than likely die on the table. So, yeah, difficult for adults, but nearly impossible for a squirmy seven-year-old? But this famous neurosurgeon didn't really give my parents much of a choice. I'm sure he tried to say it as nice as possible, but in essence, he told my parents I was probably going to die anyway, so we might as well give it a try. My parents decided to go ahead with the procedure, despite having a lot of hesitation. Now, another thing is, this particular neurosurgeon wasn't going to be doing the procedure. It was going to be a colleague of his that wasn't in on the initial consultation. So the day came for the medical procedure. We showed up at the hospital and met with the surgeon tasked with the procedure. She took one look at me and flatly refused to do it. After a lot more consultation and a meeting with the neurologist, she agreed to do it at a later date. So that second date came up, and we nervously went back to the hospital again. When we went to check in, the receptionist said our dates were mixed up. The procedure was the following week. Well, the following week, I got sick, and I had a fever, so they couldn't do it then because you know, it was too dangerous. Now, the fourth time, we actually checked in on the correct date. They prepped me for the procedure, and I was on the table nervously awaiting what was to come. Well, just before they were about to start, the machine for the procedure broke. The technicians and the doctors and the nurses said they had never seen or heard of that happening ever. They tried to find a replacement machine, but none could be found. They unplugged all the wires and said we would need to reschedule. Well, at this point, my parents believed something else was going on and said that they would not push the issue any further and would leave my life in the hands of God. And I am thankful for them for doing that. I'm now 29, and my seizures are almost non-existent now. With new technology and a new set of doctors, they discovered that I have what is called Sturge-Weber syndrome, which is like a wine stain in my brain. Every neurologist I have talked to in the past several years, and there have been several, said that if the doctors 22 years ago had performed the procedure... I would definitely not be here today because they wouldn't have been able to navigate with the camera through that part of my brain. It would have killed me. Now, was it just a series of coincidences? Possibly. And you can certainly think that. But I believe it was my guardian angel watching over me, doing whatever it could to protect me from those doctors decades ago. To honor that thought... I now have a tattoo on my shoulder of an angel to remind me of the protection I received that day when I couldn't advocate for myself. This has been another strange but true story. So what do you think? It may be hard to see the mysticism or otherworldly nature of these events, but to the people who experienced them, it was as if a shield of protection had been placed between them and outside forces attempting to pull them away. So let us know in the comments below. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Sign up for notifications so you know when the next video drops to the channel. We appreciate all the support. And thanks for watching this video. I'm Steve White. Until next time.